Hello there and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Mark and I thank you so much for coming by today. Now before I get into the discussion of the Ten Commandments of Art, I wanted to give you a little backstory as to why I'm making this video in the first place. At my local high school in town, the head of the art department is actually a good friend of mine who I've known since college. Unfortunately, he has to take a leave of absence due to a medical situation that will have him out of the classroom for a few months. So he contacted me and asked if I'd consider taking over his classes for him. He said he wanted somebody with a similar art background and experience in education to take over for him while he was out so it would benefit his students. Well, I was beyond humbled and flattered and immediately said yes. It did mean, though, I'd have to take a few months off my regular corporate contract job as a graphic designer, which, to my good fortune, they were just fine with. Now, I haven't been in a classroom teaching in over 25 years, and even though I've been in the public school system and at the college level, this is a different time. Not only would I be filling in for a man that these students love and trust, I'd have to work extra hard to gain their trust for myself, but teaching high school students can be a challenge in itself. Young people are like sponges, except when it comes to anything that sounds technical or like a lecture or an authority figure. So I thought this was a great opportunity to dust off a bunch of rules that I had, rules of being an artist, that I used to teach 25 years ago, skinny the list down, and bring it out as the Ten Commandments of Art. These have been updated to suit many areas of art, not just visual arts, but music, writing, poetry, and so much more. So. While in the classroom, the dialogue was much more interactive than I imagined it was going to be. Students weren't distracted by their phones, doodling, or zoning out. They were genuinely engaged in this discussion, which is why I thought it would be great to bring it to this video today. So what is a commandment? Well, the dictionary says that a commandment is basically a divine rule or command, usually handed down by God, which must be followed in order to live a full, productive, and morally sound life. Now, this list <laughs> is not by by any means a compilation of divine rules, nor is it handed down by God or any deity. This is simply a list of suggestions of ten basic foundation principles on how to lead a more full, well-rounded, productive, and artistically sound life as a creative person. Again, these are just my suggestions and based purely on my own experience and opinion, so if you have any additional thoughts or questions, please let me know in the comments below and I'd love to continue the dialogue with you there and learn your thoughts on this topic as well. As for now, let's get right into the Ten Commandments of Art. Number one, we do not own our creativity it is borrowed from the universe. Now, no matter what we believe or don't believe, it's important for us to recognize that whatever creative skills we possess can be altered or taken away from us at any time by forces beyond our control. That we exist in this world for a very brief moment in time and that our ability to express ourselves creatively is merely borrowed from the creative power of the universe. And that's why it's so important not to waste our talent, procrastinate, or squander our opportunities to be creative. In other words, we're born, we grow, and the time to truly be creative goes by very quickly before we ourselves expire and our life is over. So I know for me, I don't want to leave without having done everything I wanted to do in life, especially creatively. Number two, art is not about money. Those looking to get rich or famous in the arts may be in for a rude awakening. Like professional sports or music, breaking into the art scene can take years or require an extreme amount of skill or networking. Most artists working in the field are barely able to make ends meet, let alone entertain dreams of making it big. Art is not about money or fame, but rather a personal creative process of exploration and discovery, and learning to speak in a language of expression to share what we've learned. A true artist will describe their need to create as more than a want, but rather an unyielding desire to create. For those where their art does bring wealth and fame, it's usually in their later years in life, after a lifetime of experience, or after they've died and passed on. Others who get into the business of art can make a lucrative living dealing in art. Larry Gagosian is one of the most prominent gallery owners in New York City and was estimated by Forbes to be worth over $925 million. So if you're looking to get into art to make money and get famous, plan on spending quite a long time <laughs> in trying to do do so. I think most of us have realized that art is simply not about money, it's about the art. Number three, art is a self-portrait. Many artists don't realize that each unique piece they create is a symbolic self-portrait that contains great information that reveals themselves in color, 
perspective, value, mood, attitude, and state of mind. Anyone familiar with Picasso, Georgia O'Keeffe, or Rembrandt can immediately recognize the style with which they created their artwork. And despite the subject or the quality, the style in the artwork is reflective of the artist themselves at the time they created it. So, while we may not be able to see it in our own work, others looking at our work can see the same signature self-portrait in every single piece we create. Number four, creative time is sacred. With our lives so busy between work and family and school and chores and all kinds of things that keep us running around, there seems to be little time to devote to being fully immersed in creativity these days. When we do find time, it's usually in increments of just a few hours if we're lucky. Often, it's between one activity or chore or another. This is why when we're able to find that block of time to be creative, it must be acted upon and revered as sacred time, a lot like meditation, therapy, or even prayer. It must be treated with respect, and every moment of that creative time must be cherished and enjoyed. Otherwise, we end up squandering or wasting our time, forfeiting to distractions like phones and games and social media and trivial tasks that we can attend to at any time. Our creativity requires dedicated, uninterrupted time, just like reading, cooking, or exercise. And the best part is, when we embrace and indulge that time, it can be almost a spiritual experience, or <laughs> pretty close to it anyway. Number five, honor creativity. In the film A Bronx Tale, Robert De Niro plays a father who lends some sage advice to his son by saying, the saddest thing in life is wasted talent and the choices that you make will shape your life forever. It's a humbling quote that many of us can quietly agree to as we reflect on the things we spend our own time wasting on throughout our lives. We first learn life through our parents and our guardians, and they provide the foundations for what we will become, or in some cases, what we will not become. But later in life, we learn through our own peer experiences, through school and work, until we're in the position to begin shaping the world that we live in to suit our own needs. I often wonder, how does one decide to become a biochemical engineer while someone else becomes a tour guide for a local zoo? For artists, we're given a skill, a gifted opportunity from an early age, to play, explore, discover, create, and share what we learn with the world around us in a unique form of communication and expression. And that expression is worth honoring. Again, wasting our talent by giving it away to people or using it for cheap or tawdry ends as a gimmick and simply not using it at all is to forfeit that opportunity and to disrespect and dishonor ourselves and the gift that we're given in this life. So sure, the saddest thing in life may be wasted talent, but to me, the most unfortunate thing is talent that goes unrecognized. So let's take a quick break from these 10 commandments of art and come back right after this coffee break. Let's get right back into the discussion. Number six, perfection does not exist. More times than I can say, I hear people use the excuse, I'm a perfectionist, to explain why they can't move on from a project, make revisions, move on to the next phase, or do anything to step forward or away from the place they seem to be stuck or locked into. As though being a perfectionist was a good thing because, well, we're striving for perfection. But what if we're told from an early age that there's no such thing as perfection? It just doesn't exist. It's an unattainable state of flawlessness. Would we then still strive for it? Would we still claim that we're perfectionists? In theater design, one thing that I've learned, it's a quote that I use almost all the time these days, is done is good. In the high school classroom, I've learned to understand that students need to recognize when a piece of work they're working on is at a point where it needs to be finished. It just needs to be done. That any further effort is not going to change the piece and may end up overworking and even ruining it. I tell them, done is good. So just review your work, approve it, and let it go. Be finished with it and move on to the next thing. There are exceptions, of course, and I too often find myself lingering too long in a drawing or painting or even when I'm writing. It's very easy to do. There are times when I don't feel I can work properly if my space is too cluttered because I need it to be perfect before I can get anything done. But then I come around and remind myself that perfection is unattainable and I just need to clear enough room on my desk or my workspace to get the work done. 
Number seven, know the rules before breaking them. As an art teacher, it's a painful experience to watch the frustration of a young artist push paint around a canvas and not understand why their painting has gone completely out of their control. It looks horrible, but I don't know what to do is the most common expression I hear. And I explain to them that there are certain foundations to learn before anyone can be really good at something. A writer needs to understand punctuation and grammar and flow before they can write a successful story. A musician needs to understand scales, chords, and tempo before making a successful song. And even a builder needs to understand how to lay a foundation and construct a frame before building a house. Learning basic principles of art like form, composition, perspective and value, and color theory can then allow an artist to understand and create based on that knowledge and then deviate if they wish to. I look at the work of M.C. Escher, who excelled in the skill of drawing, but he was heavily influenced by his friends who were mathematicians to create some of the most stunning optically distorted images. And then you take Pablo Picasso, who was painting realistic figures and landscapes at the age of 15, but then went on to create entire new forms of art by completely breaking the rules even though he had been taught traditionally throughout his life. One abstract painter I know once told me, I'm not really a painter because I don't know the first thing about painting. I just like to make pictures using color and shapes that people like. Number eight, pay homage to and do not steal. In our culture, it's common to find musicians stealing songs and facing hefty lawsuits, or companies with products that imitate other products only to be sued for big, big money. We're taught that imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, and while that may hold some truth, when someone steals your work or your idea and puts their name on it, it becomes a very different matter. So why do people believe that it's okay to take someone else's work and use it as their own? Because sometimes there's a fine line between negative stealing and positive stealing. Negative stealing is when someone plagiarizes, imitates, rips off, copies, or borrows someone else's work without giving proper credit or getting permission. Positive stealing, however, is when someone uses work to examine or learn from, offer praise or homage to, and use as a reference foundation for something completely different, or in the case of music, to remix as long as proper credit is given. Paying homage and giving credit is a way to use someone else's work as a starting point in saying, hey, that person created this piece of work, and I'm going to use their influence to create something completely different and unique on my own, but being influenced by their work. And again, paying proper credit to it. Number nine, everything has not been done before. This is a phrase that really bothers me. <laughs> I don't know why, but it does. It's an old phrase that simply translates into, I'm too lazy to think of something new, or I have no imagination of my own, or I'm really not interested in exploring things deeper. There is an entire world of new, fresh ideas to explore in our world. Looking at the world and turning it upside down can produce the most amazing results and allow us to see things in a new way. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are quick to just give up and unwilling to see our world in that way. So for them, everything has been done before. But for those who live a life that is always moving and always evolving, almost nothing has been done before, and each new experience is as fresh and unique as a brand new day. Lastly, number 10, be an artist, not a critic. As artists, we're privileged to be able to expand our perception of the world through the language of creative expression, whether it's visually, with words, sound, culinary, or through performance. We're able to communicate with other artists in that language to share our experiences, ideas, information, and even emotions through the works we create. It's really an awesome ability that isn't shared in other fields that don't speak in the language of creative expression. As artists, there's sort of this unwritten contract that we'll do our best to see past being critical of other artists' work, whether we like it or dislike it, looking to find the message in the work instead. And that's not always easy, especially when you don't like what you're seeing. I mean, how many times have you been to a museum, a performance, or seen something online that you just didn't like at all? It's at that moment when we're repelled that we have the conscious opportunity to look beyond our critical reaction and seek the deeper meaning in the work. And not for nothing, sometimes bad art is just bad art, and it holds no meaning at all. But, while as artists, we're able to look through another artist's eyes to understand the language they're expressing in, it's the critic who offers an objective review of the work overall, not based on the language of expression, but on rules, assumed intentions, materials, and even their own rationale. The critic takes it upon themselves to act as the middleman between the artist and the audience, often misinterpreting the language of expression and offering only their judgmental impression instead. 
In some cases, the artist becomes the critic, which can often lead to debates or disputes about the true intention or meaning behind a work. It's more important for us as artists to avoid personal criticism of another artist's work and focus more on understanding the creative expression in order to be influenced, whether positively or negatively, when developing expressions of our own work. Now, there are plenty more commandments we could always add to this list, like honor your art supplies and thou shalt not kill thy art, but uh, <laughs> the ones listed here are perhaps the most prominent and important that are worth discussing. I hope this video was informative and you enjoyed the music and the drawing. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, and I would love to bring you more content like this. If you have any thoughts or comments, please leave them down below. I'd love to have a further dialogue with you. I'm looking forward to my experience back in the classroom and hope that these 10 commandments of art will help me in helping younger students learn the language of creative expression also. Thank you so much for stopping by and I hope you have a wonderful day. God bless.